in Utah nice. with a minivan. There you go. There you go. All right. Well, so this will be our first sort of uh, doctrine session. Um, and during the doctrine sessions, any question you have about church, faith, scripture, on the table. So uh, if there's something you always wanted to ask, um, it's all right if it has nothing to do with what we're currently talking about. Because my idea is that if that's in your head, you're not, you're not thinking about what I'm teaching anyways if it's eating away at you. So... Um, and usually so if somebody has a, better. do what? <laughs> make us feel good. Uh, <laughs> well, usually if somebody has a burning question, somebody else, when as soon as they ask, they're like, oh, yeah, that's a good question. I'm kind of curious about the answer too. So, um, so yeah. And we're going to go through the 10 commandments today. So that section in the catechism. So let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the gifts that you give us. Um, today, we're learning about the gift of your law that you gave to your people on Mount Sinai. And yes, even though sometimes it doesn't make us feel great about ourselves, it is a gift from you, um, the guidance that it brings. And so we ask your blessing upon our, our learning and our conversation, our meditation today on the Ten Commandments, that it may enliven our hearts and strengthen our faith. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay. So, um, so somebody made the joke that this is the small one, the small catechism, okay? Um, and it is, but the, the part of it that's the actual catechism is just this. So this is the small catechism. Sure is. Okay. And then you're probably wondering, what is the rest of this then? Uh, that is explanation. So let's say we're going through one of these uh, commandments and you're like, I don't, where, where does that come from in the Bible? What does it really mean? Um, or I didn't understand that totally. If you go in the back section it has explanation on all the different parts you go over and it has questions and answers like the catechetical form. And it also gives you the scriptural basis for the teaching that we have. Okay. Because, uh, one thing I want to make really clear, and we talked a little bit about this related to the questions that you're going to be asked on New Member Sunday when we went through that last week, um, is that the word of God is the authority that we refer to, right? So all the things that I speak of it from the pulpit are not on my authority, they're on the authority of the word of God. And this book and everything in it also has the borrowed authority of God's word. It doesn't have any authority in and of itself. If this book was not a faithful exposition of the scriptures, you could throw it in the trash. It wouldn't be useful. Okay. So part of what you're saying when you join our church is that you believe that this stuff, the stuff I'm about to teach you, is in fact faithfully uh, read from the scriptures. Okay. So that's why it's important that if you're confused about something or unsure about whether or not whether or not you agree with something that you ask about it in this class, because that's sort of the purpose of why we're going through this. Okay. Um, but this in and of itself, I want to make clear, is not an authoritative book. Its only authority is its faithfulness to the scriptures. Okay? All right. So let's start with the Ten Commandments. Just for fun, does anybody think they can recite all ten without looking? No? Well, what's number one? Thou shalt not kill. Nope. Nope. You shall have no other gods. Very good, right? Um, so that is referred to, and uh, we've got pens and pencils here if you want to write on your stuff. That is monotheism. M-O-N-O-T-H-E-I-S-M. -O -O -E monotheism. Um, as opposed to polytheism, monotheism is the worship of one God, right? Um, in the ancient world and a lot of pagan religions, there are multiple gods. And so this is considered part of the great Shema of Israel. So you'll hear it in the Old Testament. They say, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Okay. And now that sounds like old news to us, but at the time, that was a distinguishing factor about those who followed Yahweh, is that he was the only God, right? So the best example of that and the context of where these rules are given is Exodus. And Exodus is about the Exodus from where? What is an exodus? It's leaving. Yeah. Okay. 
So what's the great leaving that happens in the Old Testament for God's people? Moses. Yeah, and where does he lead them out of? Yes. Egypt, right? He so they were enslaved the in Egypt. Yeah, 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 that okay. part, right? So, um, so he leads them out, and there's a, a phrase that God says over and over and over again there, and the reason that God, you may have wondered, why does God do all these plagues, right? And because in the story, in the scriptures, it says that God does the plagues, the wonders, um, is actually the word in Hebrew. And he also hardens Pharaoh's heart so he won't let his people go. Why would God do that? Well, the reason that God does that, he tells us. He says, so that I can deliver my people with a mighty hand so that others will know there is only one God. So it's a witness not just to his people, but to the other nations that there's only one, right? Um, as opposed to in ancient Egypt, you had Osiris, Ra, um, Seti, all kinds of different gods that governed all these different aspects of life, okay? I could never understand how people could worship so many different gods. Well, I mean, it makes sense if you think about it in, from a human standpoint, right? You don't know who's, why did it rain today? must mother nature well so that term actually comes from pagan worship mother really nature does it yeah. gaia was mother nature was the personification of nature as a god really yep. um but now we explain it's like well the water droplets accumulated and got too large in the cloud and then gravity pulled them down to earth so Me i can explain that right but in the ancient world i don't know any of that stuff i can't explain it and so the the gods were ways of explaining why my harvest was great and why it wasn't great and why it rained and, and why there was a famine. And So they you know. had gods of different things. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. okay. Yeah, some were gods of harvest. Some were gods or goddesses of fertility. Mm -hmm. And you would offer sacrifices or prayers to those gods in order to receive the particular blessing that they supposedly would give you. Right? Catholic Church never taught us this. <laughs> Well, this isn't really in the catechism, but it's kind of setting the stage for why this is the prime commandment, the prime commandment um, being uh, that there is one God, right? And so it makes sense then that his first rule for us is that you don't worship any other gods because they aren't real. So Me. polytheism right. means multiple gods? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so you guys shall have no other gods. And then uh, Luther in the small catechism will add the, the, the question, and you can write this on your sheet because it's going to come up a lot. What does this mean? Okay. So when you have catechism in the Lutheran church, you become very familiar with the phrase, what does this mean? Because that is after each one of these uh, scriptural teachings, right? So you shall have no other gods. Well, what exactly does that mean? And Luther's explanation is that we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things, above everything else. Right? Um, and one of his definitions for a God is that which you put your ultimate security in. Right? So what are some things that could become your God? Life. Hmm? Life. Money. Okay. Yeah. Money. Possession. possession. Any sort of possession. Right? Sports team, maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, anything that you put in priority over God. Now, some may not make much sense. Like, if you start worshiping, like, a shoe, people are going to think you're odd. What about right? your family members? Uh, well, yeah, family can be okay. idolatrous. And there's one big one that, that hasn't been said. And probably is what Americans are most often accused of idolatry. Making money. idolatry, not money, so right. Really? Yep. So the American dream: I can pull myself up my own bootstraps. I'm an independent person, woman, man, and I don't need anybody's help. Christianity says, "Eh, not true." That's right? sad. Um, and well, and most people who live by that creed are pretty miserable. Really? Um, yeah. Well, they actively turn away other people's goodwill because they believe it's a sign of weakness against. So their you control think you over can their just life. Do it by yourself, and I don't need any help. And maybe I want to be. I can do it myself. You know, you just want to. What are you referring to? Uh, just life in general. Yes. 
So the, the scriptures teach that that you actually can't, right? The, but, but I'm, since I'm like a widow, I, I do everything myself and, you know, and, and I, I can do it. But we're not talking about like dressing yourself and making your no, own meals and things like that. Just but, things to do things, to take care of myself, take care of my house, uh, try to take care of my family, sure. things like that. But, you have family but let's say, you have let's say next week you break your leg. Okay. Yeah. And all of a sudden, all those things become very difficult for you to do on your own. But you know what? I still wouldn't ask one person. So this is what I'm trying to dissuade people. Of, okay. <laughs> now, because that because most people don't recognize that that's actually a form of spiritual warfare. And because our church has been obsessively focused on young people for such a long time, we have done very little to prepare people with that transition in old age. And the devil does attack because many people will refuse to be helped because it's seen as uh, they don't want to be a burden to other people. It's seen as weakness of self and failure and all this stuff. And the devil is going to use all that so that he can get you isolated from the blessing that God intends to give you through those he's placed in your life. Right? And I saw this in my other job when I was working at a church in Ohio. I was the youth and family pastor. And I constantly try to set up ways for the youth to serve as the body of Christ for some of the elder members of the congregation who needed help with lawn care or painting or things like this. And it was very difficult to get any of them to let us do it because as long as they weren't paralyzed, they felt eventually I'll do it on my own. I don't need your help. And I don't want, you know, I don't want to show weakness. I don't want people to see that my house isn't the way I like it and all that stuff. Right. Um, that is not a Christian mentality that the Bible teaches. Not only is that not good for you, but it's not something that you should uh, expect. Oh, wait. I think they might have joined. Hello. 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 Were you guys, were you guys planning on joining my class? Well, no, the other one, not nothing. No one's on. <laughs> oh, okay. So we figured so we'd have a <laughs> Oh, okay. All right. Well, welcome. We're talking about the Ten Commandments. Great. So, Thanks. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no problem. All right. Um, yeah, so that is that's the self-reliance um like teaching of our culture is actually not scriptural. Um, and it leads to some dangers. Now that doesn't mean that you're you can abuse that blessing of the body of christ and the support of others and i'm sure you've all known people or experienced somebody overdrawing on that because they're not doing the things that they ought to do but to exclude that is not really part of of what we what we do right so the bible even says the very first thing that's described as not good is that man is alone right man and men and women were not made to be by themselves okay um, actually I actually have no idea how we got onto that topic, but um, <laughs> totally fine, totally fine. All right, so that's commandment one, no other gods, only one God, right? And that he is number one in priority in your life, okay? He's, he's more important than Steelers football. He's more important than, than Penguins hockey. He's more important than your, your kids' sports. He's more important than your kids' schooling. I mean, so, I mean, this is a, this is a radical, like, statement, okay? Second commandment, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord, your God, Which okay? many of us do. Yes, many people do, right? Now, what is that referring to? Swearing. Okay, swearing is one example. What else is it referring to? You guys are also welcome to answer online if you if you know. Um, so the original language that was used here was not to use the Lord's name in vain. Vain, right? And you know what vain means? I thought that was swearing. So swearing is a form of vain, as it's meant in this, but it's just a part of it. Vain means empty, and so um, the general gist is not just like cursing using god's name but using it in any manner which is unworthy so if you use it empty like just as an empty phrase that's also 
a violation of the Second Amendment, even if you're not using it to swear, if it's done in an empty fashion, right? Oh, you mean if you just yell out, Jesus? Yeah. That's, or like that's when, you know, when you stub your toe and you shout Jesus, you're not like swearing at anyone, but you're using his name in an empty way. Okay. Now right? I understand. Right? I didn't know that. No, it's good. So what does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not curse, swear, use satanic arts, lie, or deceive by his name. So another way it can be misused is if I tell you Jesus says this, and I know Jesus didn't say that, and I'm misleading you by using his authority, right? Because when you, when you make a reference to somebody's name, you're citing an authority. You're like, Joey said X, so you're claiming that Joey is trustworthy. This. Right. Exactly. So when we do that with God and we say, did, you know, like that's, well, Satan's first utterance to Eve, did God really say, right? So he's, he's referencing God in a way that is disingenuous or deceptive. Is that about um, the apple? Yeah. Okay. That's what... um, so we shouldn't do that. But one of the things that Luther does in his explanation is he adds, he adds a positive to the prohibition. So that each of the Ten Commandments tell you that you um, you should not do something or you should do something you should not do something and he'll say then also keeping it as doing the correct thing with it so uh, do not curse swear or use satanic arts lie or deceive by his name but call upon it in every trouble pray praise and give thanks right? so there are appropriate places when you use god's name and that's in prayer and in praise when you're calling upon him in a time of need and faith um, and when you're giving thanks, right? Um, so. So that, I have a question. Yeah. So you hear a lot uh, sort of as a, an expression all the time. Like, oh my God, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. wonderful. Is yeah. that that oh empty? Oh my God, that's a great thing. You know, when people just say it, just, yeah. is that? violation yes so i would say that it, and not because of malicious intent but because of uh it's like disposable nature that it's just like any other word to you um and the name of god so in the old testament the name of god could not be spoken um, because man was unworthy to speak his name uh, so it was only written um, and so this is coming out of that vein um, that you are, you are to value God's name and not use it lightly. And so those sorts of phrases, it's not that you're thinking, yeah, I don't like God. I'm trying to stick it to him by just using his name all over the place. But effectively, like over time, it becomes no big deal to you, which that's the problem. The use of God's name should always be purposeful and it should have meaning. Uh, and so in the second commandment is, is, is driving us towards that. I like your explanation. You don't use God's name lightly. Yeah. That's, that's essential. That's it's very going clear. Yeah. Well, good. I'm glad. Um, and actually, I realized on my handout here, I skipped a part. So if you want to go back to the first page on the handout. Because this, so a central teaching in the Lutheran Church is the doctrine of law and gospel. So the, all the scriptures are divided either into law or gospel. And the law, and I would write this down, um, the law is what we are to do for God. So the law is always a conditional thing, right? Um, so, for example, you shall have no other gods, right? That's a law. It's asking you to do something. So, are only the people who this has been fully revealed to um, people who sort of know the law of God? Or does everyone know the law of God? I think most people don't. Most people don't. Okay. That's what. That's just my opinion. No, that's a valid opinion. Why? Okay. So the scriptures does say that the... Yeah, right. So have you ever heard the phrase natural law? 
Yes. So natural law is is this comes from the belief that the law of God is written on the hearts of, of man, okay, of all people. Okay. Um, and so it's revealed naturally by the way that he's set up the world to function, right? So um, who told you that killing somebody was wrong? Since we're little. Since right. we can understand right. anything. Now, you may, your parents may need to tell you you can't punch your brother and take his toys, <laughs> but they don't need to tell you that it's wrong to murder him. No, they don't. Okay? Um, and so the idea of natural law is that by virtue of who we are as created creatures of God, when we're created, some of that knowledge is built in, right? What What is the, um, let your blank be your guide, what do we call it? Your conscience, conscience, right? So your conscience is part of your created being and it informs some of that decision-making. Now, because your conscience is part of your created being, what happened to it when we fell into sin? got all twisted up right it doesn't always get it right and so some of the teachings that we're going through here are to help inform your conscience that knows part of the rules but because of sin things have gotten twisted and messed up um so so that's so we believe that the scriptures teach in natural revelation which is that creation and our own nature attest to the law of god right now, one possible objection to that is, well, yeah, but there have been cultures with very different moralities. Um, that's not exactly true. There have been some specific differences, but the basic differences are not there. So, for example, if you were to think of a culture that would be like very different morally speaking, it would be a culture where you're praised for backstabbing your neighbors and friends, um, where you're praised and encouraged to run away in battle, where you're praised and encouraged to not tell the truth, where you're praised and encouraged to kill other people. There's never been a society like that. Why? If they, even if they tried, it would last all of 10 minutes because everybody would be dead or running away, right? Because that's in defiance of our nature, the way God created us to be. Now, you may have people within those societies that behave in those fashions and abuse those things, but they're only able to do that because of the way it's set up to behave. Right? If everybody was a serial murderer, there'd be no society. Right? And most people, apart from sociopaths, and we could get into that if you wanted, um, understand that on some level. Okay? So that's natural revelation. Okay? Um, so that's that first question there. Where is the law of God purely revealed? So uh, circle that Exodus 21 through 17. We don't have time to read that, but that is where the 10 commandments are found in the scripture. Is Exodus chapter 20, verses one through 17. Okay. Now that is special revelation. So um, we would say the knowledge that only comes from when God reveals it to us. So, um, I mentioned to you monotheism and polytheism. So there's a belief system also called theism, which is just the belief that there is a creator God, right? Now, an honest scientist usually makes the claim that nature attests to that, right? It's the fine tuning of the universe, the order that we observe. Um, and now with our advances in science in the last half century, we've come to realize that the the possibility upon possibility upon possibility of this randomly being here is so absurd that it's really a bizarre claim to make that the universe happened by chance. Right? And, and on top of that, that life happened to come out the way it did, right? Uh, and so a lot of scientists will say, if they're not, if they're not willing to be, a, like if they're not a Christian, they'll say that they're a theist, which means that because of the natural revelation and the glory of creation, we believe there is a God Okay, but nothing in nature is going to tell them anything about the Trinity, about salvation in Jesus. Where do we learn about all of that? The church. Where does the church learn it? From the Bible, from God's words, right? So special revelation is the revelation from God himself, from God's word. Um, so 
we could come, we could all figure out and come to the conclusion just from nature and our observance of life that there is a God. But we'd never know anything about his personal nature, his plan of salvation, and any of that stuff apart from him revealing it to us. And so that we say is a special privilege. And some people that do not believe in a God at all think evolution is how we came to be. But it's got to be something else. Well, and really, science, in the recent scientific discoveries have really made belief in evolution as an explanation for things much less feasible oh. and and you don't hear about it much because publicly they don't want people to know that most the high level scientists are no longer physicists no longer buy into those theories because even by the standards of science they are no longer really viable um, which is really i mean really fascinating stuff to get into um, and we'll probably have a yeah, class here about that, that at some point you but just said, I didn't hear that. yeah so um <laughs> So that's natural revelation and special revelation. Uh, and then the Ten Commandments are divided up into two tables. The two tables of the law are the first three, one through three. And those are explicitly about our relationship with God. So one, two, and three are what we ought to do for God. Right? And the third commandment is remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. So don't worship other gods honor my name, don't misuse it, and set aside a day of worship and rest for me, okay? So one, two, and three, and those are what we ought to do for God. What's commandment number four? Oh, honor your, honor your father, father and, and, your and your mother. mother. But I didn't know it was anything else. Honor thy father and thy mother. I swear I thought it was. That's what it is. And is that not your primary human relationship? Yes. Right? Yes. So the first of the second table gives us an indicator of what the rest of the commandments are about. They're about what we ought to do for other people. Right? So the first three are our rules for how we relate to God. And four through ten are rules of how we relate to other people, starting with your primary human relationship whether you want it to be or not, right? Um, so one example I heard is when you're three years old, are you really dealing with you shall not murder or you shall not commit adultery? No. No. You are, however, wrestling with your sinful nature on honoring your father and your mother. Um, and so this order is, is, has got a beautiful intentionality to it, right? Um, so the first table directs relationship to God. In commandments one to three, second table directs relationships to others in commandments four through ten. Any questions about that so far? Okay. So the next part are the three uses of the law. So when we are reading the law in scripture, like today, what was the law in the sermon today? It's okay if you don't get it because this is part of what I'm teaching yeah. you. Is, it, it like was learning talking about the prodigal son and how uh -huh. he wanted his inheritance right away and, and it didn't do him any good. So what, what is the law teaching there? What, what, so what is being told that we ought to do? We ought to honor our parents and not honor our blessings. Yeah. Okay, it's yeah, to, to be thankful for what God has given us and that the law teaching is, this isn't yours, right? This belongs to God and he's made you a steward of it. And then the law is further steward. taught by, That's it, steward. by I have rules for the ways in which I want you to use these things, right? Um, so that's law, right? Um, now, what we're going to be talking about now is what is what is the use of saying those things, right? Or was it last week when I was talking about the chopping off of hands and feet and the gouging out of eyes, right? The law of teaching, and that's pretty obvious, right? If this causes you to sin, chop it off, right? Yeah. That's the law of teaching. That's what you ought to do. If this is going to, like, it's better for you to lose your hand than go to hell, right? Which we would say, from what I've been told about hell, yeah, probably is, right? <laughs> um, but what is the use of the law of teaching? 
Why is Jesus saying that? Right. So that's kind of what we're going to get at here. So the first use of the law is as a curb, curb on the side of the road. Okay. And in this use, the law through natural consequence teaches us to stay on, on track. Right. So if any of you have ever hit your tires on a curb before, is it a pleasant experience? No. Does it make you cringe? Yes. Because yeah. now you're thinking, well, that just took four months off my next tire change, right? Um, and so the curb is there, so you don't just drift off on the sidewalks, right? Um, and so it uses kind of a hard, firm, painful reinforcement to keep you on the straight and narrow. So practically like speaking, this. exactly, exactly. So practically speaking, for a parent-child relationship, if you don't clean your room, you don't get to go hang out with your friends. That's curb, right? So I'm giving you a rule, and if you break the rule, consequence follows, right? So that's the use of the law in the curb sense, okay? The second use of the law is as a mirror. So um, when the law teaches us, you shall have no other gods, never prioritize anything above me. How you doing on that? Fine. Yeah, you think so? Yeah. The Bible teaches that you're not. That at different times you value we other things over and above. That. Yeah, yeah. Right? So the law is functioning mm -hmm. as a mirror that shows you your own sin. So Paul teaches in the New Testament that well, apart from the law, I would have not known what coveting was. Right? And so uh, he says it in a very confusing way. Where he says, like, that the law made me aware of sin, and then by the law, I died. Right? Because the consequence of my sin is death. So that the law functions as a mirror. So, for example, um, the teaching about the chopping of hands and feet and the gouging of eyes is revealing not only like what we ought to do, but that we don't keep it. Right. So it's revealing to us something about ourselves. Right. Or um, you shall not commit adultery. And then you know Jesus was dealing with the same problem in the Sermon on the Mount. And a bunch of people were like, yeah. I keep that one. He's like, well, truly, truly, I say to you that anyone who looks at another woman with lust in his heart is guilty of breaking his heart. And why would Jesus intensify that? Because he wants them to be even more aware that they are unable to keep the law. And the reason he wants to do that is because he doesn't want them to think that they can save themselves by keeping the law. Because then they will never look for Jesus. So the second use is that the law reveals to us our own sin. It functions as a mirror. Um, and if you don't believe me, ask one of your non-Christian friends if they think there is some, you know, pretty decent group. Nine times out of ten, that's what they'll say. I did a program, Ongoing Ambassadors with Christ, when I was in youth group, and it was teaching you how to have door-to-door -door conversations, which I don't think is a very effective thing, but whatever. Um, and I was blown away by the number of people that if you ask them about, do they think they're going to heaven? The number one by far response I got was, well, yeah, I'm a pretty good person. Right? And the scriptures do not teach that. The scriptures teach that no one is righteous, not even one. Right? Um, and that's an important teaching of the law. Because until you come to that realization, do you think those people who think they're good and decent people are doing a lot of searching for Jesus? No, they don't think they need him. They're good, decent people on their own. Right? So the part of the law is meant to sort of crush the idea of self-reliance and self-sufficiency and that I can take care of all this on my own. Okay? Uh, third use of the law is a guide. Okay. Um, now, what's the difference between the curb and the guide? The curb kind of guides you a bit, doesn't it? What do you think the difference between those two is? The curb is a little more severe. The curb is severe, right? And what's your motivation for responding to the law with the curb? Yeah, right? So, <laughs> yeah, so. As a, like, like going back to our example with the, the child, if I tell my son or daughter, you can't go out with your friends unless you clean your room, why did they clean their room? They wanted to go out with so they could go out with their friends or so that they could avoid being grounded, right? 
So then their heart motivation for keeping the law was just to avoid punishment or to get something in return. Right? They weren't doing it, it as like, oh yeah, you know what? I really, it's really a good practice to clean my room <laughs> and, to, and make sure that it stays clean, you know, and, and all of that, right? Um, so that's the curb. The curb is, I don't want to get in trouble, so I'm going to do what this person says, right? Um, the guide is different. The guide has been, has now convinced you of, two, well, let's imagine we're all on a hiking trip and we have a guide and it's a place we've never been before. What do you need to know about your guide before you follow? Does he know what he's doing? Yeah, does he know what he's doing? <laughs> is he familiar with the area? Has he done it before, right? So who do you think our guide is? Jesus. Jesus. Does he know what he's doing? Of course. Yeah. Has he been there before? Yes. In everything that you're going to go through? Has he been there before? Maybe. He yeah. has, right? And so through his teaching and the gift of faith, we then follow after him, not because we're afraid of the consequences of not doing so, but because we now believe that this is the best way to go. Now, do we always do what we ought to with that motivation? Of course not, right? That's one of the reasons that this is a command. He's not asking politely. He's saying, do this, right? Now we, now we know that he's saying, do this, because like for the prodigal son, he didn't want us to end up like that, which is what happens when we don't follow the law. Um, but it's still a command. So does everybody get that? The three uses of the law, right? Now. So I'll challenge you when I preach next week, if I preach a good sermon, it'll have law in it. Because part of what we do, what we do when we come here to church is we crush the old self. So the old self is constantly trying to claw its way back into our life every day. And the old self is trying to convince us, yeah, you don't really have to do that. Did God really say that you had to honor your father and your mother? What if they're being mean to you or you think they're being mean to you? Um, did God really say? That you can't have sex outside of marriage it'll feel so good did god really say that you can't steal from people i mean this is just small and look they got so much anyways right so there's always the old sinful flesh the world and the devil that are trying to get us back into thinking things aren't really as bad as they are and that we're fine on our own and the laws one of the law's responsibilities is to show us things are not fine and we are hopeless apart from christ so that's why the service always starts with what? The Old Testament. Well, even before that, <clears throat> what's the first thing we do in the church service? We confess our oh. sins, right? And then what's the first thing God does in the worship service? He forgives us, right? Because it's sort of like when you come home, maybe you, you probably have all experienced this at one point or another. I have. You go home knowing your parents know that you did the thing you weren't supposed to do, right? Oh, yeah. So you're coming in knowing this conversation is going to happen. They know, right? That's what confession and absolution is. He knows. There's no hiding from him, right? And so we're going to address the stampede of elephants in the room. Right? And so the first place we begin is the confession of that sin. But Jesus didn't spank you. Huh? <laughs> my, I mean, when I was growing up, I loved my mother and father dearly, but I was also afraid of them on occasion because we, we were warned and that's, then we were told if we do that again. That's a parent's right. They should be is. afraid. And I'm so glad that they did that. <laughs> my mom, I would lock myself in the bathroom and lock myself in the door. Just get the key. If I open the door, mommy, will you still hit me? Yes. <laughs> I can't win. But, you know, I'm so glad I had that experience and well you know, so that's actually an insightful connection because there's a big theme in the scripture of the fear of the Lord so in Proverbs it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom right um, what do you think the fear of the Lord is the unknown no and it's quite known When, when the, in the New Testament, when Jesus says, do not fear those who can only destroy the body, but fear those who, the one who can destroy the body and soul in hell, who's he talking about? He's not talking about a devil. 
He's talking about God. So God is, and so like the fear of the Lord, like when I, Isaiah is in the presence of God and he's afraid of God, he's terrified because he's in the presence of an almighty being that he knows is fully justified in wiping him from existence. Okay. That's God. And as sinful people, the Bible says, we have made ourselves his enemy. We have set ourselves against him. Not a wise move, right? And so that's where the fear of the Lord comes from. A lot of times we say it's, oh, it's just awe or reverence. It is not our reverence. It is the knowledge. I, I think it'd be pretty unmistakable in the presence of God that like you're not in a great spot. Right? Well, yeah, because you're in the presence of God. Something's going to happen. Well, and it's, I think you're going to be acutely aware of the wrongdoing and the sinful state that you're in. Um, and there's not really going to be any way that you can do any mental gymnastics to convince yourself of it. So the times where Jesus's glory is revealed, his disciples usually face down on the ground for that reason. So when he does his transfiguration and the description, not only do they fall on their faces, but then Peter starts babbling like a moron because he's so frightened he doesn't know what to do. He starts saying, well, let's make a tent, Lord, with so that you and Elijah and Moses can all chat. And the other two disciples, Peter, stop talking. <laughs> um, so the, that, that's what the fear of the Lord is. And so one of the primary relationships in, in our human life that relates to that is our relationship with our parents. And so there is a certain amount of fear that parents can have and use in that way because they have been given the authority by God for those sorts of interactions. Right? And you know what's the other good thing? <clears throat> I, my, in my experience, even when I was an adult, you know, independent, whenever my parents would say something critical of me, I really took it to heart. Sure. It really, and it, it makes me think of something, some sort of... Well, I mean, so what, what, that's one of the reasons why these are important to understand properly, because if you've been given a great amount of authority by God, that authority can be used to great blessing or it can be abused to very great harm. Right? So like if some random person on the street calls you ugly, you don't really care. You're like, who's that person? That was weird. But if your dad tells you that, that makes a big difference, yes, right? It does. Because of the position and the authority that God has given you, right? So when God, so consequently then, the reason the gospel is so sweet is the being with the highest authority in all of creation and beyond says to you, I love you, you're mine, your sins are forgiven. They are. Some random person tells you that on the street, like, who's that guy? That's weird. Thanks. Right? Well, I don't know who you are. <clears throat> and that's, that's why we make such a strong distinction here between law and gospel when we preach and when we read the scriptures, is so that we can properly distinguish what's going on. Okay. All right, so hopping back into the commandments here. So we did one and two. So there's there's a lot of scripture references in here and questions on this handout. I would encourage you to go through those. We're not going to have time. Um, and after this class, one of the things I'm probably going to do, I started teaching a more in-depth Lutheran doctrine class in the spring that was really taking some time to go through all this, which I plan on finishing. A bunch of people have asked me about that. Um, so if you would like more information, and you don't want to dig it all up yourself, that'll be available. I don't know if it'll be right after this is done or maybe in the spring, but we'll be doing that. Okay, so we went through first and second commandments. Any questions about that? I will say the, the one point that uh, is made here at the end of the second commandment section um, on page seven in your handout, note how we use God's name in the liturgy. That can give you some, if you're struggling to really give a, like have a practical image of what's the right way to use God's name, look at how we use his name in the service, right? And we start the service with his name and we end it with his name. There, there's some that um, don't allow themselves to speak his name or even write it down. Yeah. Because Cairo. Cairo. Mm -hmm. um, 
because they've been told that it has its own power and they're so afraid of it. Because, now, some of it's just in honor of them too, but we use it in mm -hmm. the liturgy. We yeah. use it in our everyday conversation. Yeah. Up to, uh, um, what do you think about that? Being so afraid to say his name and write it down, you got to do it. So I think that makes sense in the world of the Old Testament and the Old Covenant, right? Um, because our relationship with God was one of um, sort of vicarious, like vicarious temporary sacrifice, right? So the term scapegoat comes from the sin offering uh, being placed upon a goat and then the goat being sent out in the desert as a way of, of expunging the wrath of God for the sins of the people, right? Um, so, and like the, the high priest of the temple was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies once a year, and then he would be walking in backwards, throwing blood over his, the sacrificial blood over his back, and they had a rope <laughs> around his waist in case he touched something he wasn't supposed to, and the glory of God just struck him dead, and they could drag his body out, right? We don't have that relationship with God anymore. Right, and most exemplified by the image of the curtain in the temple that separated the holy place from the holy of holies was torn in two from top to bottom, signifying that that sort of relationship with God is now no longer the relationship we have with him because Jesus has given us his own relationship. Right? Notice the prayer that he gave his disciples and that he gave us. It starts not with, like, don't say the name of God. It starts with our Father automatically by a lot by being allowed to use that phrase you and i in this new covenant with jesus have a far more repaired and intimate relationship with god than even the high priest did in an old testament covenant in israel okay and so that's why we no longer have that fear is i no longer stand condemned under the law nor do you when god looks at you now he sees christ's righteousness like that's why the pastor wears the black to signify that he's a sinner. And then well, traditionally, the pastors would always wear white robes to signify that they've been wrapped in the righteousness of Christ. So any of the holy stuff that goes on is not them, but Christ. <coughs> right? um, so that is what we are now. Or we have been wrapped in the righteousness of Christ. And so we no longer, we still have the fear of the Lord. But it's more of the fear of where we were and then not losing that faith. Right. So the image, as weird as it is, the image that I've always used is like you're you're in a city that's on a volcano and there's a giant eruption going on and lava is flowing down, and there's only one house in the whole town that's able to withstand it. Right. So and and God has informed you this is his judgment against you. If you're outside the house, you're afraid of God because his judgment of lava is coming at you. When you're in the house, you still fear the Lord, not because he's going to destroy you, but because that's his authority and he can. But he has chosen not to. He's chosen to give you refuge in Jesus. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Good, good, good thought, good question. All right, third commandment, last of the first table. Uh, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Pretty self-explanatory, but I like reading Luther's meaning here um, because it gives us some, some practical things here. So we should fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching and his word, okay? So uh, one thing I will always tell people that even if they don't end up here, and I usually say this in confirmation class because if the students are graduating high school and they're going off to college and they're finding a church, and maybe they don't have an LCMS church there, or the LCMS church there is not healthy or in a good place. <clears throat> go to a go to a church that preaches on God's word, not on what Pastor So and So wants to talk about, and actually reads it out loud in church. Okay? Um, because churches can despise God's word, and His preaching, uh, and and unfortunately, there are a lot of churches that do. If you go to church and all they do is pray and sing and the pastor says a message that's sort of loosely based on the scriptures, find a new church, right? Because in our understanding of worship, they're taking out all the parts that God does and, we're, and just focusing on the parts that we do, which on one hand, makes no sense 
Because what are you praising if you're not letting God do the work that he said he's going to do, which is why you're praising him. And two, like if any of the parts of the worship service should be removed, I would much rather have a church service where there's scripture reading, sermon, and communion with no music than a service with a bunch of music and no scripture reading, no sermon, and no communion. Now, they're both meant to be there, and they're both good to have, but if you have to choose one, there's one that's clearly more important. Right? Um, so Luther's talking about that here in his explanation. Now, another way of despising preaching is by daydreaming and by um, coming up with reasons why you don't need to go to church or you don't need to listen to this person or that person. It's one of the reasons I don't, I don't like and I actively discourage people from making me the reason they come here because that leads you to all kinds of dangerous spiritual territory because while you like me you may be clued in and, and keyed in on the stuff that god's doing in the service but maybe i said something you didn't like and I, you no longer like me and now the devil's going to use that so that now you can say well i don't like that guy i'm not listening to anything he says or anything that's read right? and then the devil wins and you lose um so the, the despising of preaching and the word. So your, your main concern with preaching, it's okay to want preaching to be dynamic and engaging, but the main thing is, is it faithful and true to the scriptures? Okay. Um, and even if, I, I hope you like me, but even if you don't at some point or another, or I do something inadvertently that annoys you, don't let the devil use that as a reason to prevent you from hearing God's word. Okay. Any questions about third commandment? Do we have any money? Huh? Do we have any money? I have some of my first. Hold on, I thought you guys were kind of. <laughs> oh, we're, yeah, we're doing our class. I was going to say, what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> uh, fourth man, we talked about a little bit. Uh, this is one, it comes with the promise. So I like the extended version of it. It's in your handout. Honor your father and your mother that it may be well with you that you may live long on the earth. Um, so God intends your family to be a blessing to you now um it's important here that we don't confuse this with prosperity gospel so that it may be well with you that you may live long on the earth is not like a guarantee that if you have a good family life you're not going to die before you're 95 or something like that okay um but it does guarantee that this sort of family will bless you right um, most people even if they are angry about or have hurt experience with their family, can tell you, if you ask them, well, if you were to make a family, what would your ideal family look like? And for believers, they can tell you pretty much the same picture, right? um, which is what God lays out in scriptures. Now, in our society, there are people that have, they want to make it whatever they want to make it. But um, so the what does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not despise or anger our parents and other authorities, but honor them, serve and obey them, love and cherish them. What is the one exception for obeying your parents? Mm -hmm. If they do something bad? It's close. What if your dad asks you to steal something? Okay, so you're going to disobey your dad? Yeah. Well, why? Because it's not God right. says you're supposed to obey. Well, first of all, when I ask him, what do you want me to steal? No, <laughs> why do you want it? <laughs> okay, those are good okay. questions. <laughs> and, and then it would probably be no. Why? And why are you asking me that? <laughs> well, why would it be no? I, I would think it would be if your parent asked you to violate any of the commandments. Right. So... Your parents have been given authority over you in the example given, right? Who gave them that authority? So God being the source of their authority, they're actually stepping outside of their own authority if they're asking you to do something against God. And so they're no longer operating within the only authority they have, which is their God given them. It's the same with government too, right? Like as Christians, we are called to obey the laws of the land except for when the laws of the land ask you to disobey the authority that gives them their authority. And then it doesn't, the Bible doesn't tell us that we rebel and tear it down and burn everything to the ground. It says, we just don't do it. So like for me, in my position, 
probably the relevant example would be like if Pennsylvania passed a law tomorrow that said I had to marry homosexual people if they asked me, then I would say no and I would go to jail. And that's what my calling would be because in, in our understanding, they would be violating their God-given authority by asking me to go against the very thing that has given them their authority in the first place. And I'm much more afraid of him than I am afraid <laughs> of them. So, um, so, that, so that's the, the exception for parents as well. Parents derive their authority from God. If they're stepping outside of that authority and asking you to go against it, then you are well within your bounds, even if you're eight years old, say, not doing that. Okay? In all other aspects, though, you, if your parents are asking you something in accordance with God's will and, and his purposes, you are to obey. Now, what about when you're an adult? Are you still supposed to obey your parents? You're supposed to love and respect them. Supposed to love and respect them. And, I mean, nothing they say when they're older really is any different than what they said when they yeah. were young. So, yeah. And it really moves more from that curb relationship with the things they ask you to do more to the guide relationship, unless you're in an abusive relationship. Then there are other issues. But, like, when I'm an adult and my dad asks me to do something, is now as more of an ask instead of go do this, right? Because our relationship has changed some that I'm not eight years old anymore, right? Um, but I still have, I still obey him, but now it's more of a guide relationship, not because I'm afraid of what he's gonna do to me if I don't, but because it is the right thing for me to do to obey him. Um, Fifth commandment, <clears throat> you shall not murder, right? Um, Why do we have to know what it means? <laughs> well, Jesus expounds on this one too in the okay. Sermon on the Mount. So um, you must be one of those people that thinks you're doing a pretty good job on keeping mm -hmm. the fifth commandment because I haven't gone out and killed anybody, right? Well, I never, the thought would huh? never enter my <clears throat> mind. That's why. Sure. And I would say that's largely the same for most people. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor and his body, but help and support him in every physical need. Now, Jesus takes us even further in the Sermon on the Mount and says that, that truly, truly, I say to you, any of you who have had hatred in your heart for your brother is guilty of breaking his command. Right? So essentially, any anytime you mentally write them off as like, I don't, doesn't matter what you say or what you do. Or, or, or like they don't exist yeah. anymore. Yep then you're guilty of breaking this commandment. Okay. We talked about the sixth commandment already, you shall not commit adultery. What is adultery? Having sex with someone you shouldn't. Okay. Adultery is a little more specific than that. Adultery is having sex with someone who isn't your spouse when you're married. Yes. And I then it's that. got other names in the context you're describing, fornication, sexual morality, all that stuff. Right? Um, does God make this rule because he doesn't want us to have fun? No. No, why does he make this rule? Because it's wrong. Well, why is it wrong? I don't know. It's just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, if any of you know people who've been divorced multiple times or remarried or have had lots of sexual partners throughout their life, are they, alive, are they generally happier people or sadder people or fractured people or damaged people? I don't think they're happy. All of the above. No. no. Yeah. They're usually not happy. Um, and I've been talking to these types of people for a long time because for some reason when you tell people you're going to be a pastor and even if you don't know them that well, they start telling you all kinds of stuff. And I've had lots of conversations with people who have multiple marriages and they have strained relationships with their children and they aren't happy with the decisions they've made that they now have to live with. And so God is actually trying to protect us from harming ourselves. Sex is meant to be a great and powerful blessing in the context of marriage, but as all, of all things that are great and powerful meant to be a blessing, they can also be great and powerful in damaging when they are abused and not just for others, but for yourself. Um, <clears throat> so what does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we have a sexually pure and decent life and what we say and do and husband and wife love and honor each other. Now, the Bible says some sort of radical things about sex that are 
American puritanical history would like us not to know, but the Bible is actually a pretty pro-sex book. And it's just pro-sex in the context of marriage, where it's safe and meant to be done. Um, and in the context of marriage, you have teachings like husbands should not withhold the conjugal rights from their wives nor wives from their husbands because sex is not meant to be used as a manipulation or a power tactic in that relationship. It's meant to be a way of expressing love for the other person. Right? It's part of that, that dynamic there. Um, so the Bible says a lot of things about um, the sexually pure and decent life is not... Um, should not be approached by sex is dirty except in marriage let's not talk about it pretend like and uh, we'll have that conversation later right so when i talk to parents i encourage them to have that conversation um and and don't make it awkward it doesn't have to be awkward right? like your kids will pick up on whether or not you feel awkward saying it, and then it might get awkward but if you're just talking about it as an aspect of life something that god has blessed you with it helps reinforce positive thinking about that kind of stuff and puts it in its proper context. It's really awkward when your kids are telling you stuff. Uh, yeah, <laughs> right. Well, and that's one of the reasons I, I try to teach that to parents because most of them think they have a lot more time than they do to have that conversation before other people are start Some talking parents to give their kids. kids a book. So, Here, well, read this. That's, that's a little too passive <laughs> because the other people that are talking to your kids about sex are not going to give them the book. Um, seventh commandment, you shall not steal. We should fear and love God so that we do not take our neighbor's money or possessions or get them in any dishonest way, but help him to improve and protect his possessions and income. This one's pretty self-explanatory. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to ask at this point, like such as, because it is self-explanatory. You take your down. So what is an example of curve, mirror, and guide? Yeah, very good. Um, that's so cut and dry. Like so let's say you live next to a police officer who has a really sweet lawnmower and you want the lawnmower a curb example would be you're not stealing the lawnmower because he'll probably catch you and then you'll get fined or you'll go to jail so the reason you're not taking it is because you don't want to endure the consequence right so that would be the curb um mirror would be um like if you like that we do steal Right. Maybe we don't steal like an actual thing, but um, another way we violate this commandment is by, uh, which gets more specific later, is coveting, like wanting things that God has not intended for us to have or he's intended for other people to have. Um, and so the mirror then reveals that like not only have we, have we stolen or done things dishonestly, but we don't always help to improve and protect our neighbor's possession. Right. Um, and then a guide would be like, we could go back to the lawnmower neighbor example, is that the guide functions as like, you don't steal your neighbor's lawnmower because that's not the right thing to do. And you're now convinced that you're actually going to have a much better relationship with your neighbor. And he might even let you borrow it. But if you try and steal it, it's probably not going to happen. Yeah. Right. Um, and that you've now been convinced that that's a wrong thing to do. Right. Um, that answer your question? Hmm. Yeah. No. Good question. Um, eighth commandment, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Uh, what does this mean? We should fear and love God so we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray him, slander him, or hurt his reputation, but defend him, speak well of him, and explain everything in the kindest way. So another one about the way we should speak about others, right? Um, does everyone know what slander is? heard that head trust he was a real jerk well that one's true though so that's not oh, I'm, okay. I'm just kidding so those who don't know i'm the head trust i know you i knew he was so slander is is making an accusation about somebody that's untrue um and usually you and when you know it's untrue then it's um what about this pastor i mean my my outlook is if i don't have anything nice don't think anything nice or have anything nice to say about someone. I'm not saying anything. Okay. So that would help you not slander people, but it would not help you defend them, speak well of them, or explain everything. I would rather speak way. well of someone I don't care okay. for. Well, say something nasty. Okay. About. So that that is actually what this commandment is calling us to. It's not calling us to say, 
Well, out of fear of breaking it, I'm just not going to talk to anyone, but it is to endeavor to speak well of them, defend them when others, so like if your friend is slandered by somebody, you're actually called to not just stand there and be like, well, it's not my problem. Yeah. Um, it is to speak up for them uh, and then explaining things in, in, a, in the kindest way so that, you know, like somebody may have said something and you could decide that it was intentional and they really wanted to make you mad or what the Eighth Commandment is calling us to do is assume that it was unintentional and put the best construction. It doesn't mean to lie, but it does, it does want you to assume uh, you know, the I, best and, I deal with this kind of stuff all the time in my job. And sometimes I have customers that yell at me. I stand there and scream at them. And I just look at them. And then when I know they're done, I say, I hope you feel better. Have a great day. Yeah. yeah. Um, last two, ninth and tenth commandments. Um, so you may be coming from a background where the commandment numbers are different. Uh, and just a quick note on that. Um, some denominations split up the first commandment into two, which is you shall have no other gods, then you shall not make a graven image or idol. Um, we they think that's part of one. Um, and then they'll put nine and ten together. And just that'll just be ten. So then their fourth our, our fourth commandment is their fifth and so on. We have it split, the ninth and tenth commandment split up between coveting stuff and coveting uh, people. Um, so you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So what does that mean? Or what is coveting? It means envy, right? Doesn't yes, it? it is a specific form of envy. It means you really want what they yeah. have. Like, oh man, my neighbor has such a sweet car. I want good. the car. Right? Yeah. Good, and good for the neighbor. <laughs> what's the difference between what the ninth and tenth man is talking about and what the seventh man is talking about? Well, I would think the we're seven. dealing with humans there. Yeah. You're actually doing it. You're actually yeah. taking the. So the seventh is addressing the action. The ninth and tenth is addressing Just what? Wanting. Just the desire that's in the heart. Right? So the coveting is what's going on in the heart. Right? Um, so it's not that it's wrong that you'll steal your neighbor's car. It's wrong that you even want to take it. Okay. Um, so what does that mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not scheme to get our neighbor's inheritance or house or get it in a way which only appears right. So that includes like maybe you're you're kind of a clever person with real estate law and you are able to, you know, use some sort of law technicality to, to swindle your neighbor out of their house. And, you and it's technically legal, that would still be breaking this point. Okay. Um, because you're also supposed to help and be of service to him and keep it right so most and most christian people like if your neighbor says hey can you can you keep an eye on this we're going to be out of town for a couple of days They're like oh yeah be happy to do that and then what happens if it gets taken or damaged under your watch you'll want to replace it or right that's part of of uh being of service to them and keeping it and if it tends, what does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not entice or force away our neighbors, wife, workers, or animals, or turn them against them, but urge them to stay and do their duty. So the difference here is in, in the first one, you're dealing with stuff. You have a new avenue of coveting attack in the tent and that you can actually make them a willing participant in your covetousness. So let's say that uh, the, your neighbor's wife or husband is in a not great relationship and they're kind of being ignored and you're a really nice person and you find them attractive and you convince them to leave that person for you and you could you, you know the human rationale could say well i mean i didn't do it they they, they wanted to do it, right um and the 10th commandment is saying uh-uh that's still on you that's still a product so even if you entice them away it's still a violation um and in fact even more so, Luther says, part of this is you should urge them to stay and honor their spouse or do the duty they agreed upon. Um, so, yeah. Um, so sort of to summarize here at the bottom of the page, 
The misunderstanding of God's law is that the law drives us away from our sin to Christ Jesus alone. If we are led to either the following false conclusions, we have not properly understood the law. Despair and frustration, which says it's not possible for me to be a Christian, or to security in one's own accomplishments. So the law's purpose is to um, not lead us to despair, but to lead us to Christ. And it's also to not lead us to being puffed up and proud and putting security in ourselves. Right? Uh, so the last section here is the law leads us to the gospel. The law leads us to the realization that we are by nature sinful and unclean, that we have sinned against God and thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ alone that shows us that we have a gracious God who forgives all our sins for Jesus' sake. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to thine infinite mercy, seeking imploring thy grace for the sake of our lord jesus christ so and you can read the words of that hymn there that kind of illustrate that so one of the titles that luther had for satan was that he was god's fool because in the life of the believer satan will levy, levy the accusations of the law against you that doesn't go away right your own simple flesh the devil in the world they're going to be like well, you said you're a Christian and that you're a nice person and look at X, you did X, Y, and Z. You're a horrible person. Well, why would God love you? Sorry, right? but in the Bible somewhere, didn't, wasn't Satan at some point like, really a good person and then he turned? He was an angel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so uh, in, in this <laughs> example here, the law is being used to accuse you and before Christ, you had no recourse. But now because of Christ, you have a recourse. You can say, you, you can even say to the devil, you're right. But I'm a baptized child of God, so go away. Right? So, um, so Luther sets this up as like a cycle. So you have the cross of Christ at the top, and it's the beginning and the end of the cycle. So the Christian life isn't about like progressing up some staircase where in 10 years, I'm going to be reading my Bible five hours a day swearing less and not ever doing anything wrong it's remaining in christ is the goal and so you go out into the world after church on sunday where you've been pointed to jesus you you experience temptation you fall into sin and you feel guilty and and sorrow over that sin and where does that guilt and sorrow drive you but back to god's word and where does god's word drive you back to the cross and so satan is god's fool because he unwittingly plays a plays a part in driving you back to the word and back to the cross. And so that's that's how that dynamic works now. So that's sort of the guide, the guide life, the post-gospel life is is, you know, you face that temptation, you succumb to it, you fail. But rather than despairing and thinking I, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, our gospel son. reading today, right? The where was the gospel in that reading? Where was the gospel in our prodigal son story? When the father yeah right yes. the the son really was unworthy to still be the son but the father didn't didn't care the father's love was not based on the condition of his stewardship of the gifts it was purely unconditional for the son and so that's that's the gospel so the goal of teaching you that is that then when we're reading those in the in the service or when you're doing your own scripture reading you'll be able to kind of break down those dynamics in your individual stories. Um, and, uh, and it's important to keep them separate now in Christ, because then that's how you can maintain your sense of self-worth as God's child, apart from your failures and apart from your successes. Pastor. Yeah. When, when, I mean, I think it's, it's religious I, I personally to, feel that the error is human to forgive divine. Yep. I mean, that's what you for, we're forgiven every week. Yep, we are. All right. So um we're gonna close the word of prayer. Sorry I kept you a little long, but I wanted to get through my those real quick. That's all right. <laughs> all right. So let's close the word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the fact that you gave us your law. And we give you thanks that even though we are unworthy of 
much less your attention. Um, you love us. You love us so much that you sent Jesus. And now when the law accuses us of our own sin, when it shows us that things aren't okay, that we aren't good people, that we have no righteousness of our own, we are not left to despair. But now you have sent Jesus to pull us out of that despair, to stand us up, to wrap us in his robe of perfect righteousness. And he takes our sin upon himself and pays the price which we deserve. Help us as we go throughout our days this week and all the weeks to come, that when those accusations level themselves against us, whether it's through our own sinful flesh or through the devil or others in the world, that we can acknowledge the reality of our sinfulness, but not despair, but we can rejoice in the mercy and grace that we have in Jesus. And come back again on Sunday, confess that sin, receive your forgiveness, and so go out again and share this joyous message with them. I ask you to watch over each of these, uh, these uh, member, future members of our church as they go out this week. Guard and protect them from the assaults of the devil and bring them back safely next week to be in your word again. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me.